and welcome to Father Spitzer's Universe at the very busy intersection of faith and reason. So many people go there these days in search of truth. I'm Doug Keck. Of course, Father Spitzer is the man in charge of this particular universe. But if you want to ask him some questions, you need to email us, of course. And you can also check us out on Facebook and send us questions that way. Tweet us on Twitter. For all things Father Spitzer, there's the Magis Center website, of course, as always. And there's also CredibleCatholic.com, which is what we're working through, of course. And this week we're moving on to Jesus' intention at the Last Supper. That'll be the topic from Credible Catholic for this particular program. And also, just to mention, as we always do, the Book of the Month is Advent Reflections, Meditations for a Holy Advent. It's a wonderful book published by EWTN based on some reflections that were done by various bishops and priests from the UK earlier in this uh, last decade or so. And uh, there's a wonderful interview I did with uh, one of the bishops coming up uh, this coming weekend, but it's a wonderful book for Advent. Advent Reflections is the title. Get it through our religious catalog. RC.com, of course, is the place to check out everything that's actually Catholic and you can get from us. And remember, by purchasing through the religious catalog, you support the work of Mother Angelica. After all, Father Spitzer, as we turn to you, Mother's the one who founded religious catalog, so we have to keep that along with everything else she founded here. So how are Absolutely. you, Father? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm doing great, Doug. Yourself? Yeah, good to see you. I know you've been busy the last couple of weeks, out and about, as oh, they say. Yes. Oh, yes. I uh, went to the Bishop's Conference. Very exciting. So uh, um, anyway, uh, a lot of good things happening for Majes, the Spitzer Center. So it's great. Right, exactly. So if you want to start us off with a prayer, as always, that would be great. You bet. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your many blessings to us, particularly the blessing of this ministry. We ask you to uh, help us, dear Lord, to... Uh, um, uh, to, uh, through your Holy Spirit, inspiring us, guiding us, and protecting us so that mm -hmm. everything we do will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your people, your church, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And Mary, seat of wisdom and venerable Fulton J. Sheen, pray for us. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's right. A shout out from all the New Yorkers for that coming up. And wanted to mention, too, that EW10 is working on covering that. December 21st is the day. That's Saturday. You can look forward to it coming up in a few weeks. Uh, we're working uh, Peter Gagnon and Steve Beaumont and all our guys. Mike Holmes are working feverishly now to put together our production of that particular event. So look for more information oh, coming great. soon. But it will be on Saturday, December 21st. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of other Fulton Sheen related programming uh, coming forth from EWTN uh, pr right prior to and in and around that beatification happening in Peoria. You know, it's interesting, I saw an article that jumped out at me. Somebody was quoting Bishop Fulton Sheen in relation to what's going mm -hmm. on in the church and things today. They said, Bishop Fulton Sheen declared in 1974 that we are entering the fourth fall and rise of the church in which our great test will be to resist, quote unquote, the spirit of the world. And he, he, these are marvelous days, however, in which to be alive. I thank God that I can live in these days because these are the days of testing. And just to remind people, he said that 45 years ago. You know, when I was graduating from college, that's unbelievable. But how right he was. Oh my gosh, I mean, that's just prescient, uh, prophetic beyond mm -hmm. belief. Absolutely. Also remind everybody, yeah. the present Holy Father is in Thailand presently, will be in Japan as well. Our coverage of the events that are coming to you from those locations begin tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. That's tonight on EWTN where we cover the Pope wherever he travels. People can look forward to that. And we'll get into our topic uh, having to do with what the uh, Jesus' intentions were at the Last Supper. Let me ask you one question before we get into some of the questions people have sent us. Uh, another article sure. that struck me, headline is, The Church of Canada May Disappear by 2040, says New Report. So here's a study that came out, and this is based on church statistics from 1961 to 2001 using five different methodologies. I, want, I know you're always interested in methodology, so I've mentioned oh, that. Oh, yeah. Uh, they say <laughs> membership in the Anglican Church, and this is in Canada, fell from 1.3 million in 61 to 357,000 in 20, 
17. So yeah. give you an idea of what's going on with the church. Quite honestly, yeah. you hardly ever he even hear about up in Canada, and maybe you know why now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the Anglican Church is dropping at a much uh, more significant rate than the Catholic Church is in Canada. But make no mistake about it, the mm -hmm. Catholic Church is also dropping right. uh, along the same lines at, that the Pew survey indicated. That would be a 40% um, uh, decline among millennials and Gen Zs, same as in the United States. So. Um, uh, again, our whole institute, this Credible Catholic right here, the ModjaCenter.com, everything we're doing is trying to mm. uh, get to the students, get to the millennials and Gen Zs right. before they make that decision to leave not only the church, but mm. belief in God. So uh, anyway, that's, that's our mission, and, and right. it's, uh, uh, Canada's as affected as, as we are in the U.S. Yeah, there was a comment in this particular article uh, from Religious News uh, in the future, Canadian Anglicans will focus more on the church's calling to be a faithful witness in Canada instead of being drawn into a quote-unquote vortex of negativity about the decline. And without you getting into being, becoming the center of that vortex, what's the problem? Why is this happening, do you think? Well, I think, um, and now uh, among the Anglican Church, I don't know why they are having such a precipitous drop. Uh, I can tell you um, among uh, faiths in general, uh, and especially the Catholic Church, the number one problem for millennials and Gen Zs is the perceived dichotomy mm -hmm. between faith and science. So that's the major problem. And uh, there's plenty of evidence from mm -hmm. science to point not only to God at the beginning of the universe, God in the, the fine tuning of the constants of the universe, to point to uh, you know, a, a soul, a transphysical soul, which will survive bodily death, mm -hmm. and to point even to Jesus and Jesus' resurrection through things like the Shroud of Turin. There's a ton of evidence out there to, mm -hmm. to stop this problem. And, and I would just encourage readers, please go to CredibleCatholic.com. Mm -hmm. If you are living in Canada or in the United States or in Europe or in Australia, mm -hmm. please go to CredibleCatholic.com. Click on the seven essential modules. Get that evidence for those young people. It really works. Mm -hmm. We got a 97% positive to very positive uh, rating from the students saying that it helps them to fend off their doubts and maintain mm -hmm. their faith. And in the, the first five modules, the evidence for God, the evidence for Jesus, the evidence for the soul, the evidence for the church, mm -hmm. it's really important that they, they look at those modules because if, if they do, I think it will really solidify their faith. The mean age at which this is occurring um, according to the CARA study, that's the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate at Georgetown mm -hmm. University, they say the mean age uh, for students uh, making their decision basically to bail out, not only of the church, but to bail out of God mm -hmm. is 13. Right. So that's why we have made a middle school curriculum, uh, which please show this to your middle school students. Mm -hmm. 13 is the age, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is when it's happening. And yes, of course, they're going to wait until they're out of the home. When they get to college, they're, at, you know, they're 18, 19 years old. Mm -hmm. That's when they're going to wait to declare it. But they're beginning that decision. Right mean age 13 years old you got to give them the evidence asap right. and so uh, as soon as possible so so please please go to CredibleCatholic.com. Mm -hmm. please click on that big red button seven essential modules it's all free right. watch these modules with your kids there's just these little five minute videos you can watch them and and so that's the number one problem the number two problem is the problem of suffering there's no question about it uh, kids are worried that an all-powerful, all-loving God would not permit suffering. Right. They do not see that there really is a good side to suffering, that suffering shocks us out of superficiality. Suffering enables mm. us, uh, you know, to open our hearts to God much more deeply. I mean, just look at our own lives. I mean, when do we turn to God most deeply? When do we have that next uh, deepening of our faith, etc.? It always occurs right, you know, <laughs> during the time of suffering. Right. Suffering also enables us to empathize and be compassionate with people. Suffering 
suffering also really elevates our humility, you know, uh, uh, you know, outside of our arrogance, our pride, our superficiality. Suffering does a lot of good, as every saint mm -hmm. has testified, and certainly Jesus has testified. And above all, you can offer it up. Right. And, and there's so much merit in doing that for the mm -hmm. people we know who are in need. So that's a second problem. And so, again, that if you look at the sixth right. and the seventh of those seven essential modules at CredibleCatholic.com, the sixth and the seventh mm -hmm. deal with that problem. Why would an all-loving God allow suffering and how to use right. your faith to suffer well? Right. So those, that's the second problem. The third problem is big time peer pressure. And, and so what happens is the kid goes to school, he doesn't have any evidence, he doesn't have any rationale uh, for God or for suffering or why an all-loving God would allow suffering, etc. And so he's going down there you know, almost like quack, 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 you know, <laughs> and he goes right into that, uh, into that uh, school mm -hmm. and some kid assaults him or even a teacher, uh, I mean a, a, a well-meaning science teacher, a well-meaning whatever, mm -hmm. you know, so, so what happens is that kid comes right in into the uh, um, uh, you know the classroom and, and into his peer group and and he's being assaulted you know he's accused of needing a crutch of being naive of not knowing anything about what science has done today etc cetera, etc cetera. and that kid not having any responses is just bowled over and of course he succumbs or she succumbs to the peer pressure. So we, we really have to mm -hmm. do that. The fourth area definitely is the peer pressure regarding morality mm -hmm. and moral relativism, okay. and, and, and especially with respect to the sexual revolution. And so, um, uh, you know, we have to give the rationale. Why does the church teach? Uh, why did Jesus, it's not the mm -hmm. church, it's Jesus. Why did mm -hmm. Jesus teach that sexuality outside mm -hmm. of marriage, uh, that there's something not just morally wrong with it, it's going to mess you up. It's going to be spiritually wrong with it, emotionally wrong with it. Why did he teach that? Now, there's a whole bunch of reasons for this. We're putting together a whole new curriculum on spiritual and moral conversion. It's not yet up on the Credible Catholic website, mm -hmm. but it will be. Mm -hmm. and, and essentially, our objective is to give a rationale. Why did Jesus teach this? But using contemporary psychological statistics, Mm -hmm. What happens to relationships, et cetera? So the, the, the number of right. premarital relationships that you have before marriage affects the longevity of the marriage and the happiness within the marriage. We've got solid statistics mm -hmm. for this. It's, it's a big negativo. The, the number of, of uh, not just premarital relationships, but the length of time that you're in, for example, a, a, um, um, a cohabitation uh, situation, the longer the cohabitation, again, it negatively affects uh, not only the longevity of, of the mm -hmm. marital relationship, but happiness within that relationship. And of course, they're directly related. It also undermines relationship with God. Uh, you know, there's now mm -hmm. some really good statistics out there that uh, people that are basically engaged in cohabitation and sexual relations are kind of, they, they know the tension between that and, and the relationship with the Lord, uh, with Jesus, and, and they begin to distance themselves uh, from the church. And, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And when they do that, essentially, again, they leave themselves open uh, to all kinds of, of cultural temptations, uh, which are, are, are really, you know, from pornography, honestly, uh, to um, mm -hmm. a variety of other things that, that are just not healthy. And so we have to right. just begin to talk very rationally right. to these kids about why this is not you know, it looks like it's harmless. Pornography looks like it's victimless. Right. You know, sexual relationships and lots of sexual relationships before marriage, premarital sex, looks like it's harmless to them, to them, to the, because of their cultural indoctrination. And, and it's, it's not harmless. It's not victimless. Right. In fact, it's, it's terribly destructive to future marriages. I mean, I mean, look at the correlation between the divorce rate and, and, and the number of, of sexual relationships post-sexual revolution. I mean, if that doesn't clue you in, you know, that something is radically wrong here. Mm -hmm. Marriages are, are not lasting. Families are, are being just tipped over. Mm -hmm. I mean, there has to be a commitment to the family and commitment to marriage, a commitment to level three and level four, as I would call it, you know, to, to, to God. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the, the, the couple that prays together stays together. We've got great statistics to va validate this. We should be telling that. But to, to, isn't to, the problem with some of that the fact that 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 
These are statistics that today people want to believe they're either not true, they're religiously, religiously biased, or as part of that, for you to point it out means you're somehow a bigot or you're dissing some group of people who have a different view than yours. Well, I, I have to tell you, these are statistics from the Center for Disease right. Control, yeah. Columbia University, or, you know, I mean, uh, what are you talking about? I mean, the, 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 you know, the spiritual life statistics vis-a-vis -vis prayer and, and the longevity of marriage, they came from seven secular universities in the United States. Right. I mean, uh, are you kidding me? But then why don't you ever I mean, hear about them? You don't hear about them because they don't want to talk about well, them. Well, they're not they in the counter, forefront right? of the press. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah, they run counter to the culture, and the press doesn't right. put them out there. I mean, I was really shocked when I read the uh, anti-cohabitation right. uh, article in the New York Times. I, I nearly fell over out <laughs> of my chair. But, uh, but I, I have to tell you, it was published there, and I, I thought it was a very well-done article. Um, I forget the, the lady who did it now. This is about uh, five, six years ago. But mm -hmm. it, it, it really published the statistics. She talks about why kids do it. She talks about why it really isn't. Uh, an aid to a future marriage, but instead it's a detriment, mm -hmm. etc. But these right. are things that are all over. Um, you know, secular studies are being done. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the press does not publish that. I mean, right. it's just like, uh, you know, in the Shroud of Turin thing. I mean, the, you know, uh, Dr. Tristan Casabianca and his team, you know, disproved that 1988 carbon dating right. through a statistical analysis of the stratification variegation uh, in, in the sample. I mean, or, or, I mean, there's C conclusive evidence that sample th that was taken had probably a mixture of threads uh, you know in other words uh, you know the the weaving of a much right. later thread by the sisters after the fire of Chambry fire, right. with linen uh, with the uh, with the the actual shroud um, uh, threads etc and all, you know now it's now been disproven right now what do you see about uh, this this study which disproves this supposedly peer-reviewed uh, a study of the, for the 1988 carbon dating. Mm -hmm. You see microscopic, you know, print in maybe one secular journal, and you see uh, it covered by uh, some Catholic uh, newspapers. Period. But mm -hmm. this is a really first-class study. It took uh, uh, Tristan Caspianca. It took him almost. I mean, after 30 years of freedom of information requests from the British Museum to finally get the raw data from the sample, you know, finally the guy gets it, disproves the 1988 uh, carbon dating, and, 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 and finally we've got the evidence, and no, no publication. Uh, so I look at it and right. I just go, well, uh, you know, read the Catholic press. This is why you have a Catholic press and Absolutely. a Christian press, ladies right. and gentlemen. Right. This is why you have it, because the secular press is just plain not going to cover it. Right. And that's why we got to put that material out. That's why there's Credible Catholic and the Magic Center and EWTN and, and CNA you and bet. all the other uh, outlets that, uh, good outlets yep. that are out there that you can trust. Let's get to some questions before we tackle our sure. topic about uh, Jesus' sure. intentions at the Last Supper. A couple of quick questions. Uh, dear Father Spitzer, I'm currently discerning my vocation, which includes the priesthood. What are some strategies mm -hmm. that you would recommend in going through this discernment? Thank you for this great program. Josh from Maine. Josh from Maine, the number one thing to do is get a spiritual director if you do not have one. Okay. Your spiritual director can, t uh, uh, you know, guide you in your reflection and in your discernment, you know, and, and you need a guide because, you know, sometimes so many different things come at you, both positive and negative, overly positive and overly negative. You know, it's hard to sort it all out. And of course, boy, the minute you start discerning that, your enemy, the devil, will certainly be trying to influence you adversely. So I can say that with, uh, with, uh, with great certainty. So here's what I would recommend. Number one, get a spiritual uh, director, uh, a, a good one that you really trust. The second thing is listen to that spiritual director in terms of the guidance he's giving you. Number three, you got to, you know, discern within yourself wh whether you actually feel a call to certain general things, right? Certain people uh, need that kind of reinforcement uh, from another human being mm -hmm. on a very intimate level, and they need to give themselves to somebody on a very intimate level. That's, you know, I, I would call that a depth person. So you go really deep 
with you know a, a specific uh, wife and, and, and your kids and and you get reinforcement from them and you give yourselves to them and they're your number one priority priest doesn't do that priest goes with breath so essentially Josh what you you would see is is that uh, do you have a call to be serving a lot of people mm -hmm. and, and not uh, I mean obviously you can uh, be committed to certain individuals uh, who you love or who are your good friends or your family members right you can be committed to them in a very special way as a priest but generally we don't have that number one priority are the people that we are talking with who are in front of us who have need of us spiritually and temporally they are the people who are our number one priority of the moment and the kingdom of God mm -hmm. is our number one priority of the moment so do you feel called more to the kingdom of God and to the the persons that you are serving uh, does that kind of you know that is that your kind of first priority is that how you sense it mm -hmm. or do you really sense that no I really want to commit myself to a specific individual mm -hmm. who also will commit uh, uh, herself to me mm -hmm. so uh, that that would be the idea okay. of, of, of that so you got to figure you know the Holy Spirit is very consistent in his call he's going to give you the graces uh, of the call to priesthood mm -hmm. there are a variety of other questions that you should really answer and, and, and the last thing you, you need, need to really do is identify where you want that priestly vocation. Right. A diocesan vocation, mm -hmm. that would be in a specific area, right? right? So you, you pick, you know, Saginaw, Michigan, or whatever it is where you live, and you pick that, and you say, do I want to serve there around my family and my friends, and this is a place I grew up, I, I want to stay here, or do you want to become a religious? And, and, and maybe if you're like a Jesuit religious or something like that, you would, you know, the world is, mm -hmm. is basically, or a Dominican religious, you know, uh, you, you can be assigned a lot of different places mm -hmm. instead of a specific diocese. Or do you want to join a monastery? Do you have a more contemplative vocation rather than an active vocation? You're going to have to do that with your spiritual director really look at the charisms and see your call and then discern it in light of that right. just remember Josh you're never gonna get an absolute you know rarely does now sometimes he does with St. Mm -hmm. Paul and others right you, you get the call you know I mean basically you know uh, uh, who are you sir I am Jesus and you are really harming me mm -hmm. I got it Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's the call. Now, mm -hmm. most of us do not get that kind of a definitive call. Mm -hmm. Most of us are going to get a call that goes over the course of time. Mm -hmm. That certainly happened to me. Right. You know, th things began to happen in my junior and senior year of college, and I couldn't stop. I mean, you know, there was, you know, f first of all, I thought, mm -hmm. boy, you know, my religion's the most important thing to me in my whole life. What mm -hmm. am I going to do here? And, and then, you know, uh, I thought, oh, I'll be a deacon. I'll be a permanent deacon. I'll get married, and then I'll become a deacon. Then I'll have a family, and, and that's the way I'll do it. And my mother sent me all this material on being a permanent deacon, and I thought, okay, I can calm down now. I don't have to discern this right away. Mm -hmm. And then one day, I'm walking out of St. Alice Church and I look at the book rack and I see this little pamphlet on priesthood and I just sat there and I read that whole darn thing from mm -hmm. cover to cover and I just looked at every single picture and I looked I just read every single word and it just like emblazoned it in my right. and I just thought why am I feeling this you get how God works but he slowly right. but surely he gets at you mm -hmm. and as he finally you know I, I, finally I just had to admit to myself mm -hmm. gee I think I'm really being called to be a priest right. and he's right. not letting me right. uh, off the hook right. so uh, so anyway just remember it's gradual it's not gonna be the definitive call in most cases it could be for you but right. in most cases it's, it's gradual well, you know, I, my little story is I could say I, I found myself looking at maps of Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> well, I was in New York going, why am I looking at maps of Birmingham, Alabama? Okay. Well, I, I, I found out later, I think, why that occurred. So, anyway. Oh, I, I know why that occurred. <laughs> here's, an, here's another question. Dear Father Spitzer, I love your show and all the teachings you provide. My question is, I know the Bible speaks of God's time being different from ours, like in 2 Peter where it mentions thousand years is but a day to God. So I was wondering, does that mean it was possible that Christ spent more than just the recognized earthly hours of days in hell when he died, or could he have spent years in hell in his time? Sincerely, Michael from Sarasota, Florida. Obviously, the issue of the use mm -hmm. of the word hell and yeah. what that actually means, yeah. et cetera. So. Sure. 
Well, Michael, let's start with that very uh, point that Doug mentioned. You know, mm -hmm. what is the word hell there? It, it does not mean the place of the damned. Mm -hmm. That's that's not um, uh, in, in that context. In 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 turn of uh, in first century Judaism, uh, the the term that's translated as Hades in Greek, mm -hmm. which we translate into hell, that Hebrew term is Sheol. And Sheol is the realm of the dead. Mm -hmm. That's where good people go. That's where bad people go when they die. So there's not been a judgment yet. It's just like a resting place for the dead. And that's called Sheol. And so what Jesus does, and, and, and the early church took that, right, uh, that meaning of Sheol, the place, the resting place of the dead, mm -hmm. right, and not the good dead and the bad dead. And they took that term and, and they basically said, Jesus descended into the realm of the dead. Don't think into the realm of the damned. Mm -hmm. He descended into the realm right. of the dead. And what did he do? He called up everyone who was worthy, whether not just the prophets, but the, you know people who were trying to follow uh, the Lord according to their conscience, according to their religion, right? He calls those people um, into the sainthood, right? Mm -hmm. Into the redemption which he wrought on the cross. So it, he, when the, his act, his complete self-gift mm -hmm. is completed on the cross, he descends into the realm of the dead, when, uh, which is called hell, quote unquote, right? That, that uh, translation there of Hades mm -hmm. and Sheol. And he goes in there, calls up the good uh, into the domain of heaven, and they become saints just as we do. Now, with respect to the, t the you know, the time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we know that Jesus' resurrection takes place on the third day. And so you can say, well, did he spend the whole time there in the realm of the dead? Mm -hmm. We really don't know, Josh. He might have spent a split second in the realm of the dead because Jesus, you know, now being completely glorified mm -hmm. uh, as he goes into the realm of the dead, I can tell you this right now. He didn't need more than a split second to figure out who's going uh, up and uh, and who's staying uh, in the realm. So the the point, of course, is he knows. So it could have been a split second. It could have been, um, uh, for all we know, uh, three full days. But uh, my suspicion mm -hmm. is it wasn't three days. I think what uh, happened there was a split second. He he makes that uh, that judgment, that decision. He's mm -hmm. uh, glorified in the domain of the Father. Um, and he spends his time, uh, quote unquote, time, uh, but uh, his, uh, his, his uh, human apperception, uh, a, a glorified human apperception time with the Father, and then comes uh, mm -hmm. to be with the apostles, uh, you know, on the third day right. when he appears to them. Uh, both um, uh, at the Sea of Gal uh, the uh, closed room, and later at the Sea of Galilee. Right. In fact, when we, we talk about Jesus' intention at the Last Supper, you kind of bring up the whole collapse of time yeah. is kind of involved in, yeah. in that as, as well. Uh, yeah, let's see. Exactly. I think we got one more question here. We'll kind sure. of slide in here. Uh, the Ephraim sure. Spitzer, I was strong in my faith when my kids were young until the oldest was nine. After that, I fell away. Now, in the last five years, I've realized I want to come home. I've been gone over 35 years. My courage is weak. What I have missed, has confession changed? That's the question. Can you ask a priest to help you? when you know you've messed up a large part of your life and have a long confession to make. This is Elaine. Elaine, absolutely. Uh, first of all, you want to make a, a connection with your priest. You don't have to tell him your name or any of that nature. You can do that anonymously. Uh, but you, you may want to just say on the phone, gee, I'd like to have an anonymous confession. Mm -hmm. now, in other words, in a, in, in a confessional. So that's mm -hmm. the same. You, you, or you go to the confessional and just say, I'd like to have an anonymous uh, confession. Uh, would I be able to meet you at the church at 4 o'clock on Saturday? Or, what, or whatever the convenient mm -hmm. time is for you and the priest uh, to, to get together and just let them know uh, I, I have a lot there. I, I need some help. I haven't been to confession 35 years. But what I would do, Elaine, uh, it, the essence of confession has not changed that much. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, um, it, 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 you know, there's a 
blessing at the very beginning uh, from the priest. Uh, what you do before you go into the confession is you make an examination of your conscience and you can help yourself. Uh, there's a couple of really good examinations of conscience uh, that are out there. I know mm -hmm. that Catholic Answers has a very good one. Uh, in fact, I think EWTN has a very good I'm one. I'm sure we do. Um, uh, uh, examination of conscience. Uh, so if you just put down Catholic examination of conscience, uh, I would recommend uh, uh, the Catholic Answers one or the EWTN one. Uh, there's, a, there's several others, right. but look them over and just take a look at uh, th these uh, examinations and just get a head start on it, Elaine. And then when you have that head start done, make that a uh, first right. of all, make the appointment with the priest before you go and look for the examination. Just get that on the right. calendar. You don't want to waste any time. Right. Then, of course, he's going to give you a date and a time. You meet him in the confession box. He doesn't have to see you or anything. Uh, you know, just say, I'd, I'd like to do this. Mm -hmm. And he may do it like a half an hour before regular confessions start or 20 minutes before regular confessions start, as often happens. Right. And then he can help you right through it and right. if you have a little bit of preparation from that examination of conscience that's going to help but all you really need to do is is uh, you know say what your serious sins are and the, and to the best you can remember right. do not get worried if you didn't count it right you can just oftentimes say, just say many times I right. did X right. you know I, I don't really remember the number of times but right. in 35 years I did it many times and and so trying to get exact you know right. things sometimes is, it's just impossible uh, unless you have a photographic memory right. so the, the, then the, the key thing after that is 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 to you know he'll, he'll take you through the act of contrition really you know I, I, you know repeat after me and I've done this many many times in a confessional Oh my God, I am heartily sorry. And then you repeat, Oh my right. God, I'm heartily sorry. And, and you just go right through the act of contrition. And then, um, you know, and that's Elaine, usually there uh, posted. You, so if you don't remember it, you can read it. So it's not. Yeah. That's right. Uh, often enough, it is posted. Mm -hmm. But if it, if it isn't, the priest can absolutely take you by, through right. it line by line. And then once that's done, he's going to give you absolution. And I'm telling you, Elaine. When you go through that absolution and you hear, you know, and, and I absolve you from all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, you're going to leave that confessional. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, you're going to be on a high. That's you're right. going to be reconnected with God. 35 years and I'm lighter. You, that's what you're going to be. 35 <laughs> years <laughs> lighter. Yeah, right. And we've got Absolutely. To, and, right. And I've going to break the grip of right. the devil on you, and it's going to put you right on the path to salvation. And then you start going to Mass again. Don't Absolutely. worry about your courage. Have courage. Set the appointment with the priest. Right. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a break. We'll be <laughs> back right after this. Much more with Father Spitzer. We'll get into the topic and maybe a couple more questions. There's much more ahead. Stay with us. And thank you so much, as always, for staying with us here in Father Spitzer's universe at the intersection of faith and reason. We return to Father Spitzer out on the West Coast at the Christ Cathedral campus, our studio there. Now, Father, it's like we talked about in the beginning about people, uh, you know, with reason and, and the issues for mm -hmm. them are, are because of science. Now, here's a, a kind of an interesting question. It's a little bit different. Sure. Dear Father Spitzer, sure. how does one feel the presence of God? I'm a believer in my Catholic faith intellectually, but spiritually mm -hmm. it does nothing for me. I prayed, I spent time alone in church, I feel nothing. I did when I was younger, but now nothing. How does one have a relationship with Jesus? This is Byron Perry from Oakville, Ontario, Canada. Uh, Byron, great question. Three quick points. Number one, do not overemphasize the importance of feelings. Feelings happen, they are important, and you will recognize them as you pursue your spiritual life more deeply. You will see them, but you can't control the feelings. God gives consolation, God gives desolation. But I'm going to describe them a little bit in, in a second. Second point that needs to be remembered. 
God communicates in many different ways besides feelings. Let's go through a few of those ways. Number one way, God communicates right in the back of your mind. And I'm telling you, you get these little ideas and they start germinating in the back of your mind. And suddenly you, you have a sense of, uh, you know, um, something needs to happen. Or you, you have a sense of, I ought to go into that church after you haven't been in church for 10 years. Or whatever it is. But things start, God doesn't want to ever go contrary to your freedom. He's never going to force you to do anything. Mm -hmm. So he's very subtle. And what he's going to do is he's going to plant little thoughts, not feelings necessarily, but thoughts in the back of your mind. His interest is to move you in your freedom. Mm -hmm. So that's his first interest. So those thoughts go in the back of your mind, but you've got to be receptive to those thoughts. Right, right. They'll come up, they're going to be subtle, but you've got to receive them and you've got to think, I better do something about that. Mm -hmm. And that's you got to move it from I got to do something about that to putting it on your calendar so that's that's the, mm. the first or just doing it just getting it done right. so that that's the first thing God can also Byron use negative feelings to get us to deepen his relation our relationship with him and and what does he do he can wake you up uh, I call it my two o'clock to three o'clock wake up call where uh, let's suppose I'm doing something really stupid or I've just sort of I'm getting off the rails again mm -hmm. right I, I you know whether it, you know in my spiritual life I'm getting lax or you know I'm just uh, cutting corners in various areas etc cetera, etc cetera, you know or whatever it could be something much more serious it could be you know uh, uh, you know if a person is, is just you know, deciding they're just not going to go to mass, or if a person is is just getting into a, a, a lifestyle that's morally going to undermine them and just open them to the influence of the devil, right? If that's the case, mm -hmm. then God generally will give you first a nightmare or two. Mm -hmm. And what will happen is, who knows, you'll wake up from the nightmare, and the nightmare, uh, maybe Mary will be crying. Uh, or in the nightmare, you will be dropping in, into like a, you know, mm -hmm. a, a pit that's going, it seems endless or something or, or whatever. It, it, so it could be a kind of a nightmare. And, and so those negative ones, that's when you get one of those things and, and God seems to be almost present in it. And you mm -hmm. can get this sense that God's not giving you the nightmare to scare you. He's giving you the nightmare because he loves you. Mm -hmm. he, he wants you to get out of whatever you're in or the blessed mother wants you to get out of whatever you're in hmm. when, when you when you get that nightmare you got to respond mm -hmm. you know so you got to think okay what is it lord this right. it's time for prayer what is it lord you're calling me to what do you you want from me where do i have to make a change in my life or sometimes you know already where you have to make a change. often you know if something happens to me i know when i have to make a change in my life and i can say oh i got to do this and i got to do that you know and and i i make baby steps always the baby steps mm -hmm. or what about bob you know and and so what why do we want to do that because we want doable things where we can start to make a change. Remember, you're not going to make a 1,000% turnaround overnight. That isn't going to happen. So think of some things you can start doing now and start a plan for how you're going to amplify that in the future. Right. So that's another way that mm -hmm. God communicates. A third way that God communicates is he just sends people into your life or a program into your life. Like I said, I was walking out of St. Aloysius Church one day. I go to the book rack. I see this little booklet on priesthood. Why did I go and pick it up? Why did I have to just read it for an hour from cover to cover? Mm -hmm. Why did I do that? Because God was literally drawing me over to that thing. And and, you know, and of course, the whole time I'm looking at it, I'm going, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm going to become a permanent deacon. I'm really going to become mm -hmm. a permanent deacon. You know, but of course, the whole time I'm getting drawn right into the priesthood. Right. But the point is, is God can use desire, mm -hmm. uh, number one, to draw you into something. And sometimes he brings a person into your life instead of a book. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes a person is saying something and this kind of overwhelming desire comes over you. A desire to listen, a desire, you're thinking, this person's saying something really important. Mm 
mm -hmm. you know, and you're letting it matter to you when originally you might have blown it off. Mm -hmm. But that's God trying to open you up. He's trying to fill you with that sense of desire, but you have to move on it. He mm -hmm. won't force you. And right. so the, the point, of course, is if that desire comes over you, don't say no. You got to just sort of say, okay, Lord, I, I got it. I, I, I see the desire. What can I do uh, mm -hmm. better to follow you? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's another way in which he, he communicates. Again, mm -hmm. s desire has feeling involved in it, but it really isn't feeling. It's a kind of, uh, it's more than that. Mm -hmm. It's being drawn towards something uh, with a, a sense of expectation and hope and fulfillment mm -hmm. in it. And of course, that, that is God, the mm -hmm. expectation, hope, and fulfillment. So that's, that's a third okay. way that God works through feelings. But just the last to conclude it um, uh, for you uh, is that the fourth area is that uh, you know, God can use feelings, and he mm -hmm. uses both negative feelings and positive feelings. I already talked about the negative feelings, but he does also use positive feelings right. as well. Now, first of all, uh, I think it was Byron, you, you are living right now with a whole lot of spiritual consolation that you don't even recognize. So the, the, the first mm -hmm. point that you, you have to, to, to consider is what would happen if God turned off the spiritual consolation you were feeling right now? You don't even recognize. It's like a radio mm -hmm. that's going off. Like my, my mom had radios going off everywhere in the house. Right? If, if you turned off that radio, the silence would be deafening. Well, if God turned off what I call the ordinary, everyday co consolation that he gives you, that you probably don't even recognize because it's right. like that radio playing in the background, if he turned that off, by, you would be in a state of desolation instantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you wouldn't know where to stand. You'd have an emptiness and a loneliness and depression that was so profound, you wouldn't know where you're standing. So remember this, right. when you say, I'm not feeling anything, no, you're not mm -hmm. feeling any extraordinary consolation, mm -hmm. but you're feeling a whole lot of ordinary day-to-day -day consolation. And if God turned that off, like the radio, right. Right, the, the silence would be deafening. The, the emptiness would be uh, you know, profound. And right. so the, the main thing is God is giving you that consolation all the time. Right. It's like so, they say, you know, a lot of times you don't notice mm -hmm. that you had something until it's missing, then all of a sudden you realize, That's oh, right. there, was, there was a lot more there than I realized. So let's get into, yeah. in the last 10 minutes or so, into chapter 1, oh, Jesus' okay. intention at the Last Supper. You say his intention mm -hmm. is not only to give us his body and blood, but his whole self, crucified and risen, and act in unconditional love, which redeems our sins, heals and transforms our hearts, and leads us to eternal life with him. Why is this, the idea of emphasizing his intention important? Yeah, because uh, we misunderstand in this, uh, you know, 21st century, in this culture, we misunderstand what his intention was. Mm -hmm. We look at that and go, well, gosh, he's giving us his body and, the, and his blood. Well, that seems like cannibalism or something to me, you know, and they get all down the, uh, you know, a, a different route and so, and so forth. So we got to, first thing we have to do is get into Jesus's mind. What and his heart, and what did he mean? What was he intending for us? The gift of his body and blood is his real body and blood given on the cross. There's no question about it. We believe it. I certainly think it has been validated in several Eucharistic miracles, particularly right. mm -hmm. uh, the Buenos Aires one in 1998, overseen by Pope Francis. But I, I, I mm -hmm. totally believe, uh, you know, that it's his real body and blood that that was uh, crucified on, on on Calgary. And I can talk more about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. But it's more than that. It's his risen body, his glorified body as well. So this is, you know, as we receive that into us, we receive not only, uh, you know, this, this foretaste of his glorification, but his risen body is the basis, it's the substrate for the whole mystical body. We call it the mystical body of Christ. Paul calls it the body of Christ. And so when we receive his body and blood into us, his risen body into us, we are integrated into the whole mystical body. We're part of the church. We're part of the communion of saints. We're 
not, you know, eschatologically part of the communion of saints, but we are united with the saints and with the church and with all the graces that come through that. And we can help the church through our integration. And the church, with all of its saints and, and all of its angels and, and, and you know, all the, the, of its graces, can just literally plug into us. And it makes a huge difference. And if we take advantage and we go to church and we are active in our parishes, we're going to uh, um, the Eucharist and reconciliation. It's going to make a huge difference to us. So we're plugged into that. So that's the second benefit is we are you know get the foretaste of his glorification integrated into his mystical body. I mean, we absolutely can sense when Easter's coming, when Christmas is coming. We can sense it spiritually, not just, oh, good, materialistic Christmas is coming and I'll get the present I want. It's no spiritual Christmas is here and I'm with the communion of saints. I'm tending, you know, this is the rejoicing in the kingdom of heaven that I'm going to be able to experience. And that's why we have these sort of little mystical experiences at Christmas time and Easter time and, and even during Lent, you know, the profound repentance and so forth. So the main thing, though, that's the second one. The third grace that, that comes uh, from, uh, you know, the, the Holy Eucharist, what Jesus intended was he really did want to give us his unconditional act of love. And, and this is why we say offer it up, for example. When, what Jesus was doing on the cross is offering up his body and blood. Yes, his body, his physical body, his risen body, all of that is present. Uh, indeed, his divinity is, even, uh, is, is present. But that is an unconditional act of love. Remember what it says in the Gospel of John. There is no greater love that a man can have than to give his life his whole self for his friends. What Jesus is saying there is unconditional love is my gift of self, my body and my blood, my whole self, my whole life given over for you. Listen to the Eucharistic words. This is my body given for you. Get it? This is my unconditional love. My, my whole self, right? The word body is translated by the term soma, not mm -hmm. sarx, which means my whole self. This is myself given for you. That's just like John's mm -hmm. definition of love right there. This is my unconditional love mm -hmm. for you. Here it is. And so why does he want to give us this unconditional love? To break the, the, the grip of evil and the spell of evil over you. You received that Eucharist. It's the worst thing that ever happened to the devil. It's the same thing with the sacrament of reconciliation. You get absolution. It's the worst thing that ever happened to the devil because now, of course, his grip, grip is just broken by the sheer grace and the sheer love of Jesus Christ, which he can't stand. And it's a love that heals you, by the way. And, and it's a love that redeems you, by the way. So this unconditional act of love, it's not just like a, a sort, of, sort of static love. Mm -hmm. But what it is, it is like a dynamic love that's reaching into your heart, transforming you into the very image, uh, uh, into the uh, very uh, heart of Jesus Christ, core ad core loquitur. And at the very same moment, it, it, it's uh, healing you from all the, the, mm -hmm. the, the problems of, of, of past sinfulness. So, I mean, it's, it's just literally an anti pill to the devil, a healing pill for you, and a transformation pill for, you know, your transformation into the heart of Christ. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why he's giving us this unconditional act of love. Do you think for a second, you know, that, that you know, Jesus cannot heal just like that with the absolution, the, the right absolution, right there in John 20, 20, right? right? And do you think that, that Jesus cannot heal, you know, past the, 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 the problems of past sin and the, and the, the real defects of past sin, uh, you know, through the Holy Eucharist just yes. instantly. His unconditional act of love is infinite. The devil's grip is finite. Your sinfulness is, is finite. And, and so, bam, oh, you know, you, you, you get that real grace. And so this is why we need to know what did he have in mind? Because this is what he had in mind. This is not cannibalism. This is an unconditional act of love. This is a gift of his risen body. This is an integration into the, his church. This is his means for transforming us in his heart. This is what he right. intended. And, and of course you say, well, I think that's, you know, Spitzer, the theologian who's, who's superimposing all these things on Jesus. If you really believe that, please study the scriptural evidence for one second. Mm -hmm. Here's what you do. You go to CredibleCatholic.com. 
IncredibleCatholic.com. You click on vol click on the big book. Mm -hmm. Click on the big book. Then click on volume nine, and then go to chapter one. Please look at the evidence. I've got the evidence from Von Rod, from Marcia Eliada, from you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Hans Schurman, mm -hmm. from Joachim Jeremias. I mean, the, the, you know, these. This is the, the, you know, uh, Johannes Betts. This is not Spitzer mm -hmm. uh, waxing eloquent. These are good historical exegetes who are looking into the mindset of first-century Judaism. Jesus, who is saying that as the Messiah, the Son of God, he's saying this knowing that his father will collapse the time. He's saying this knowing that his risen body of the future will become part of the body he's giving to his apostles. This is the unconditional love that he himself says in John's gospel he is offering. Believe me, I am not just superimposing this, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, Spitzer, the, the bloviator. This is definitely uh, uh, what good historical exegetes think is happening. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I, I got to say, our Protestant brethren, they, they don't recognize it. And, and I'm sorry that they don't. Because this is the true interpretation. Rudolf Bultmann did not have the correct interpretation. I have to tell you, you know, even uh, 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 Martin Luther's wavering on this. Uh, on this, he, he, he really did not understand what Jesus was doing. He, he had a very Germanic uh, and therefore Greek view of, of what anamnesis meant and, and, mm -hmm. and what the prophetic word meant. And, and so I, I'm, I'm I, I, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, I'm not so a, in mean, any way trying so you, to be arrogant. What so I'm trying to say is, so when you, you say, look at this very seriously. Right. So when you say a Greek view, is that versus understanding the Hebrew mentality? Because you say that, it's that's important correct. to note here that the first century Judaism did not have a view of a merely symbolic or abstract prophetic utterance. That's correct, and that's correct, and the same thing with anamnesis, you know, so remember, do this in memory of me, that idea of memory, in the Greek way of looking at memory, yes, that means calling to mind, that's not what a first century Jewish person would have thought at all, a first century Jewish person, especially a messianic prophet uh, who is the son of God like Jesus, what would he have thought? He would have thought that memory, uh, which is translated anamnesis in Greek, that word meant reliving it so that the past uh, would collapse into the present moment and that uh, present moment then would have the full efficacy, the full grace mm -hmm. that was there when Jesus gave his body and blood to his disciples at the Last Supper. That's what he intended. That's how a Semite would look at it. Mm -hmm. That's certainly how the Messiah would have looked at it. That's certainly how um, the Messiah, who is the Son of God, uh, and, and, and uh, it was the Son of God, would have looked at it. So uh, all we have to say is you really need to look at the historical evidence. It's really important that you do. If you do, you will not doubt the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And you will stop the silly kind of, uh, you know, Germanist and, and, you know, I, I mean this with not with arrogance. I just say, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rudolf Boltman and company, mm -hmm. they just misunderstood and gave definitely a Greek interpretation, not only to, uh, to, to St. Paul, but to the Gospels themselves, which I think was very unwarranted. But a, a student of, of Rudolf Boltman, Joachim Jeremias, mm -hmm. revolted against him and wrote a book called Jerusalem at the Time of Jesus. And after this, he wrote that Noia uh, that, that uh, uh, New Testament theology, um, uh, Volume One, and you just read that book, and especially the book, the Eucharistic Words of Jesus, and then follow. Uh, I mean, it's it's really a very important and good historical book. How a Jewish Messianic prophet would look at the Holy Eucharist. And by the way, he was a Lutheran, mm -hmm. so uh, I mean, uh, he, he departs significantly from Luther and from Bultmann, uh, his 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 uh, you know. Uh, in, uh, mentor, his influencer. So I, I, I would just leave it at that and, and just say this is a, a very, very important um, uh, book to read. But please go to uh, CredibleCatholic.com, go to the big book, go to volume nine, go to chapter one. The evidence is, is right there. This is really important stuff. It is the spiritual pathway to salvation. It, it's Jesus's pathway to our salvation cannibalism hardly calling something to mind as some sort of symbolic ritual 
hardly. I mean, it just it's just a zero. It's a nothing burger. Mm -hmm. So uh, for all intents and purposes, stick with good historical exegetes, exegetes who are looking at it from the Semitic right. point of view, not looking at it from a Greek point of view. Very good. With that uh, punctuation on that point, we shall leave it there. Father Spitzer, if you give oh. us your blessing on the way out the door, oh, that would be great. Uh, absolutely. And please bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may Almighty God send His Holy Spirit down upon you and, and inspiring you into the mentality of Jesus, into the heart of Jesus, into the love of Jesus help you to know not only the significance of the Holy Eucharist, but how it is leading you, and indeed how you can feel and desire that movement that he gives you, and, and how you can feel and sense the breaking with evil that comes through this most wonderful gift that he has given us, the gift of peace and transformation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much, Father. We shall see you next week as we continue on with this topic and then move ahead. Intention at the Last Supper. What was our Lord thinking? Well, Father Spitzer's helped us figure that out. We'll see you next week, Father Spitzer. And, of course, all of you watching here at EWTN, don't forget uh, you can catch our show on YouTube. You can catch us on radio as well. And also, EW10 Bookmark, as I mentioned earlier this weekend, we're going to have the Advent Reflections, a special interview I did with uh, Bishop Alan Hopes. Look for that. Also look for our coverage of the Pope, which is uh, beginning this evening on Wednesday, running through the weekend. So between uh, Thailand and Japan, EWTN will be covering all of that. And don't forget about Father Spitzer's materials, all available through the EWTN Religious Catalog as well as on the Credible Catholic and Magic Center websites. With that being said, once more, we shall see you next week at the busy intersection of faith and reason. We'll see you there.